Welcome to Mission Minute News. I'm Dominican Sister Jean Harris. First, the headlines. G20 leaders renew crucial commitments. Sisters answer the call. Dipalaya Oasis. Canadian bishops ask Pope to join in the healing. New vocations in the SVD. Bishop appeals for release of Haitian hostages. G20 leaders renew crucial commitments. On the last day of their two-day summit in Rome, leaders of the world's 20 biggest economies agreed to step up efforts to set the limit of global warming at 1.5 degrees Celsius. Their goal was to bridge divisions over how best to reduce carbon emissions ahead of the current COP26 meetings in Scotland. The G20 group is made up of 19 countries and the European Union, and together they account for 80% of the world's carbon or greenhouse gas emissions. In his opening address to the summit, Italian Prime Minister Mario Draghi said governments had to work together to face up to the formidable challenges facing our world, warning that going it alone is simply not an option. The one and a half degree target is the key limit, the last ditch scientists have said is necessary to avoid new disastrous climate activity. Observers cautioned that few concrete actions were cited along with the goal. And besides sustainability, their agenda also included international economic recovery, COVID-19 vaccines, and rising energy prices. Regarding COVID, the leaders agreed to supply more vaccines to poorer nations. Activists had urged them to end the scandal of global vaccine inequality, noting that less than 10% of the population in poorer nations have been vaccinated up to now, and called on richer nations to support the UN target of vaccinating 40% of each of them by the end of 2021, with a pledge to vaccinate 70% of the world's population by mid-2022. Sisters, answer the call. All over the world, groups are working to protect our earth, our common home, from corporations that want to desecrate it for profit. Many are in oil production and have a direct connection to climate change. Catholic sisters, who are also all over the world, have been accepting the challenge for over 25 years. For example, the Columban Sisters in the Southern Philippines and the Society of the Sacred Heart at the UN. All the orders want a just transition to a sustainable world that lessens the imminent effects of global warming on the earth and on people. The International Union of Superiors General, representing 600,000 sisters, has been promoting their Sowing Hope for the Planet campaign for several years now. Congregations must be concerned if we take seriously the idea of nobody being left behind, says Sister Teresa Cotteron of the Sisters of Charity Federation. Many religious orders of women and men have goals featuring practical climate protection. They only hope and pray that the COP26 meeting underway in Glasgow will give strong impetus to this urgent work of saving our planet and ourselves. Dipalaya Oasis. When the Medical Mission Sisters were founded in 1925, dedicated to providing the poor of the world better access to health care, they had a three-acre farm, a house, and a wall. Inspired by Vatican II, 
In 2006, they started a community called Deepalaya, House of Light, in Kandwa, Madhya Pradesh, India, which aims to integrate psycho-spiritual, socioeconomic, structural justice, and ecological dimensions into their healing charism. With healthcare becoming more of a profit-driven business around the world, the sisters wanted to promote holistic health, body, mind, spirit, and an ecological awareness that food is medicine. Mother Earth provides every nutrient to keep us healthy, a value stressed by many other groups, including the traditional Indian Ayurveda system. The medical mission novices not only get their religious training, but also learn the value of caring for Mother Earth and an awareness that humans are not separate entities, but one with Earth. In a word, they get to practice the UN's 17 Sustainable Development Goals. Dipalaya continues to reap the efforts of their pioneer sisters who planted an acre of fruit trees, mangoes, papaya, banana, chiku, gooseberry, custard apple, and lemons, another of grains, wheat, corn, millet, and pulses, one of vegetables like carrots, cauliflower, beans, and eggplant, a flower garden, and finally, an herbal garden with many medicinal plants for aches and pains, injuries and illnesses. All kinds of birds, squirrels, and even rats and snakes enjoy the land all through the day. Mosquitoes are the only unwelcome guests, which the sisters control with natural pesticides and an abundant use of netting. Honeybees flourish and are harmless as they fly freely around the plants and flowers. Two hires from a leprosy colony, now free of the disease, have been working the farm since its beginning, and two watchdogs complete the staff. Composting and water, wastewater containment are regular practices and the sisters share their fresh well water with over a hundred families who cannot afford to buy their own. Community coordinator, Sister Molly Vatican, a trained environmentalist, is now manager of the farm, which shares its fruits with local people who have come to rely on their good taste and quality and see Deepalaya Farm as an oasis. Keep up the good work, sisters. Canadian bishops ask Pope to join in the healing. A recent Holy See press release announced that the Canadian bishops have invited the Holy Father to make an apostolic journey to Canada to include participation in the pastoral process of reconciliation with indigenous peoples and Francis has indicated his willingness to accept. The bishops are already engaged in discussions with indigenous peoples who have shared stories about their suffering and challenges in the residential school system. Likewise, Pope Francis has expressed sorrow for what he described as the shocking news of the discovery of hundreds of unmarked graves detected in the grounds of the church-run Kamloops Indian Residential School this past summer. The residential schools were government-sponsored, but many were run by Christian organizations. Operating from the 1880s into the late 20th century, the schools were established to assimilate indigenous children into Euro-Canadian culture. Children were forcibly separated from their families for extended periods of time and forbidden to acknowledge their own heritage, culture, or language. Former students tell of extensive and systemic abuse within the system. 
Speaking during the Angelus on June 6th, the Pope said he was praying for the Canadian Church and for the people and issued an appeal to political and religious authorities of Canada to work together to shed light on the matter and commit to a path of reconciliation and healing. Newest vocations in the SVD. God's will is my will is the theme guiding 28 newly professed members of the Society of the Divine Word in India's central SVD province. On October 15th, their Eucharistic celebration was presided over by Bishop Chako, SVD, of the Indoor Diocese. In his inspiring homily, he exhorted the newly professed to let God be the driver on their life journey. Trust and rely on God's skills, either on the smooth road or difficult road, but surely the safe road. Father Jomon James, Provincial Superior, received their vows and urged them to carry forward the charism and spirituality of the society and not be caught up in the world of consumerism, reports Father Emmanuel Varghese, novice master. On Mission Sunday, October 24th, 20 SVD missionaries received the Mission Cross during a Eucharistic celebration at St. Paul Major Seminary in Ledalero, Indonesia, Eastern Province. Concelebrants were Presider Father Patris Pa, Vice Provincial of Ende Province, and Mission Secretary Father Giannis Lobo. In his homily, Father Patris emphasized that the experience of a personal encounter with God urges us to proclaim the good news and manifest his mercy. As disciples of Christ, the love of God compels us to say, here I am, send me. He said, he said further, the mission cross requires us to remain steadfast in our faith and vocation, to persist in the challenges of missionary service, faithful, patient, and always happy to carry the cross that is imposed on us missionary disciples, reports Father Chris Ibu. Finally, in Nanuk on the island of Timor, 54 young men began their canonical year of discernment and formation at St. Joseph Novitiate. As novices, the men will deepen their relationship with God and prayerfully consider their vocation and future as divine word missionaries. Bishop appeals for release of Haitian hostages. In an October 19th appeal on social media, Bishop Pierre-André Dumas of the Diocese of Ans à Vaux and Miraguan in Haiti urged the kidnappers of 17 American and Canadian missionaries to free the hostages unconditionally. My heart as a shepherd of souls remains deeply shaken by this wicked and hateful act which continues to debase once again the already too tarnished image of our beautiful and dear wounded country of Haiti and to mortgage our ancestors' ideal of freedom, of fraternity, and of equality, he said. The missionaries and family members of Christian Aid Ministries based in Ohio were abducted by the 400 Mawozo gang on October 16th while visiting an orphanage. Dumas made a personal appeal to the kidnappers to show some humanity, to have mercy on these foreign aid workers who came to help build an orphanage for poor Haitian children and orphans, and to unconditionally release these innocent victims. 12 adults aged 18 to 48 and five children ages 15, 13, 6, 3, and 8 months. 
The bishop also appealed to political authorities in Haiti, asking them to do everything in their power to obtain a peaceful release of the missionaries. But the abduction is only the latest sign of Haiti's deteriorating political, social, and economic crises following the assassination of President Jovenel Moise in July and a massive 7.2 earthquake in August. The FBI is trying to locate the missionaries and get them released before the supposed leader of the gang, Wilson Joseph, carries out his threat to kill the abducted if ransom demands are not met. Also making threats against Prime Minister Ariel Henry and Chief of National Police Leon Charles. Turning to countries that call themselves friends of Haiti, the bishop asked for their help to put an end to these inhuman acts which degrade the country and impede the future of so many young people. Combined Arnaldo's Retreat. In celebration of their 30th anniversary of ministry in Russia, the Holy Spirit Sisters organized a retreat which included attendance by the SVD Confreres. The retreat theme, Union in the Holy Spirit, was represented by an icon of Pentecost, symbolizing the spirituality of the Arnoldus family. In a beautiful retreat house with a backdrop of Lake Baikal, the retreat presenter correlated the image with symbols used by founder Arnold Jansen, the SVD medal, the cross of the sisters, and the image of the heart of Jesus in the clouds. This type of combined retreat is bringing new life and zeal to the missionary service of the Arnaldos family in post-Soviet countries, says Brothers Vignu Sulej. Migration Crisis in Northern Chile Borders around the world are experiencing various crises as refugees desperately escape violence in their home countries. One such border lies between Chile and Bolivia in South America, where many migrants escaping Venezuela find themselves seeking refuge through unauthorized crossings into northern Chile at the Church of Colchane. Father Ronald Aminga, SVD, parish priest of San Andres de Pica, and his parish social pastoral team visited Venezuelan migrants in a shelter in Cachane. When they arrived at the El shelter, the migrants, which include many children and nursing mothers, are hungry and have been unprotected from the extremes of weather. Then they must continue walking long distances to reach Huara and other cities in Chile, hoping for a better future. But thanks to the efforts of SVD Father Edward Prabhakaran and his social pastoral team, this critical migratory need is being addressed. Animators spiritually renewed in Bratislava. During the weekend of Mission Sunday, a spiritual renewal program was held in the Mission House of Bratislava, Slovakia, for animators who organized the SVD Spiritual Renewal Summer Camps. Fourteen animators participated in the program entitled, He Calls You to Live, led by Father Tomas Beleja. The young people were helped to perceive God's call and also to enjoy one another. On the eve of Mission Sunday, October 24th, they praised God in music and all-night adoration. On Sunday, they led the music at Eucharist and ended their spiritual pilgrimage with lunch. These young people, both experienced and new, are a promise for the continuity of our camps for years to come, said SVD Father Lukas Hanusik. Holy Spirit Sisters celebrate 75 years in Ghana. Members of the Holy Spirit Missionary Sisters serving in Ghana recently unveiled the logo for their 75th anniversary celebrations, which begin in December. 
75 years in Ghana have not been all rosy, but God's work never fails. The SSPS sisters are convinced. Divine Word missionaries, also serving in Ghana, sometimes in partnership with the sisters, offered heartfelt congratulations and prayer for their continued success. Caritas fights poverty over 70 years. The word charity means love in the form of generous help given to persons in need, right? The word has at least 105 translations around the world in at least that many countries, according to a quick search on the web. One of these, Caritas, from the universal Latin language, is the perfect name for a certain organization that for 70 years has been giving generous help to persons in need internationally. To mark the anniversary, Caritas Internationalis, a worldwide confederation of relief, development, and social services organizations, is holding a series of online conferences that focus on its work in seven operational regions, Africa, North America, Latin America and the Caribbean, Asia, Europe, the Middle East and North Africa, and Oceania. The Confederation is made up of 162 Caritas organizations, according to Secretary General Aloysius John. He described the global network as an instrument to serve and accompany the most vulnerable, ensuring them a dignified life. He also noted Caritas' long-term objective of creating the conditions for lasting development and sustainability, and said the church's preferential option for the poor leads us to live in mercy. The first conference, Seven Decades of Fighting Poverty and Protecting Human Dignity, held October 28th, focused on its partners in North America, home to three of the oldest organizations in the Confederation. Catholic Relief Services, CRS, founded in 1943 by the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, which provides assistance to 130 million people in more than 110 countries and territories. Catholic Charities USA, founded in 1910, a network serving the poor, particularly in the areas of housing and caring for migrants and refugees. And Development and Peace, Caritas Canada, begun in 1967, a democratic movement committed to finding alternatives to unjust social, political, and economic structures. Together with the international community and society at large, the Secretary General said, we need to help each other to build together a community capable of promoting integral development. The pandemic, he said, has highlighted this need and challenges us to global solidarity through faith. The series of conferences concludes on the anniversary itself, December 12th. Pro-life over death. After a hiatus of seven years, Oklahoma has renewed its intent to carry out seven executions over the next five months. The plan was temporarily interrupted by a lawsuit in federal court questioning the constitutionality of Oklahoma's use of a lethal injection drug meant for anesthesia. The Catholic Church teaches that each person is born with inherent dignity that we do not forfeit by misdeeds or even by committing crimes that cause grave harm. Rooted in this belief, the Church regards capital punishment as a fundamental life issue and deems it inadmissible in all but extremely rare cases. See the Catechism of the Catholic Church, number 2267, 
and Pope John Paul II's Evangelium Vitae, number 56. Archbishop Paul S. Coakley of Oklahoma City says, the church recognizes the grave harm done to victims and the need for healing and justice, but it also understands that executions only perpetuate cycles of violence and often provide no measure of healing for families. Further, that to oppose the death penalty is not to be soft on crime. Rather, it is to be strong on the dignity of life. And beyond moral considerations, practical arguments militate against the death penalty generally. Death row costs are greater than those of life imprisonment. There continues to be wrongful convictions, racial bias, arbitrariness, and a proclivity for targeting vulnerable populations, such as people with intellectual challenge and severe mental illness. For all these reasons and more, the use of capital punishment has faded over the decades, both in the U.S. and beyond. Twenty-three states have outlawed the practice, and 13 others have gone 10 or more years without an execution. Bethany Webb, who lost her sister Laura in Orange County, California, 10 years ago, agrees. It was a mass shooting in a Seal Beach salon by one Scott DeCry that took eight people's lives and almost killed Bethany and her mother, Hattie. Three of the slain women were women at Laura's wedding earlier that same year. Webb had always been opposed to the death penalty, and even after it became a deeply personal issue, her opposition didn't waver. I want to be better than him. He's not going to put hate in my heart. I think that we as a society have to stop hating. We have to stop thinking that violence solves anything. The death penalty teaches that you can take the life of someone who isn't a threat to you. We're better than that. If you have a comment or question about any of our stories, please email us at missionminutenews at wordnet.tv. You can also post your comments below each video on the YouTube. We promise to respond. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel and click on the bell icon. Share with others about the channel and the variety of programs you enjoy there. Please join us every Wednesday for our online Eucharist and Adoration and Benediction of the Blessed Sacrament, starting at 11 a.m. Pacific. To send us your prayer requests or to sponsor the Wednesday Eucharist, contact us by phone at 909-383-4333 or email us at mail at wordnet.tv. This is Mission Minute News. Until we meet again, stay safe and well, and may Jesus' love for you make you smile.